Hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. You're welcome to the service today. This is the King Scott Bible Teaching, Prayer, and Leadership Development Service. We have been on a series in the book of Acts, and today we're going to continue from where we left off at. But before we start off, let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for yet another day you've given us. You are in charge. You are the one who is overall. Our lives are in your hands. We belong to you. So we thank you, Lord, for the breath, fresh breath, new breath, new morning, the sunrise, the, even the winter and, and all of that. It's all signs of life and living. So we are grateful for each one of them. And Holy Spirit, we thank you. Thank you for your presence, continual presence with us. Even as we go into the word, we welcome you. We yield to your leadership. We yield to your teaching. Teach us according to the words of Jesus. And may the words of, the, of, of, of this message on today, this lesson on today, be a blessing to God's people. And for that, we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So we've been on a series in the book of Acts, and uh, we've been taking that from uh, uh, the Kingdom Ministers United, United Curriculum. Uh, school of ministry curriculum so we're going to continue we we but before we do that we i just want to invite us and um kind of talk about a program we'll be having tomorrow for for our friends and those who normally join us or listen to the recording or watch the recording of, out of the united states tomorrow is thanksgiving it's marked as a thanksgiving day in the united states every november 25th <clears throat> thanksgiving in the united states so we will be having a brief service. It's going to be 10 a.m. U.S. Central Time. Um, it's just to be grateful to the Lord for this past, you know, season that we're coming out of, how he has kept us, and, and, and you know, we're going to go into prophetic worship and praise and prayers. That's all. It will be brief. It won't be too long. So we're inviting you to join us if you can. Now, it will not be recorded. Uh, so it's not going to be on Facebook. It's not going to be on YouTube uh, due to um, a copyright infringement issues with Facebook and YouTube. So we don't want to we don't want to cross the line. We don't want to offend them. So we're not going to. It will be recorded on Zoom, but it will not be made public. But you can join us, and and you have there on the screen uh, the the uh, join in information. Um, the, the the link up there is the direct link to join, and then. If you're calling with just audio, then uh, you have the meeting ID and passcode right there. So tomorrow, 10 a.m. U.S. Central Time. Uh, for those who might want to join from outside of the U.S., please uh, compute the right time as is appropriate to your region and to your time zone. So tomorrow at 10 a.m. U.S. Central Time. So we're going to continue from where we left off at. And we, today we'll, we'll be going to session 12, the book of Acts session 12 and if we look right at the second session right there we already dealt with uh, uh, the first session clash of covenants but today we're looking at administration in the new church administration in the early church administration in the early church or the new church both apply so we will recall that the writer of the book of acts clearly stated his writing was a treatise we remember that going back to the beginning that he's writing a treatise. And, and let's refresh our memory. What is a treatise? A treatise is a systematic exposition in writing of the principles of a subject. You get that from dictionary.com. So a treatise is a systematic exposition of the principles of a subject or a subject matter. In this case, the Christian faith. So when the author says, it's a treatise I'm writing. Remember Acts chapter 1, verse 1, the former treatise of I written O Theophilus. So we know the book of Luke and the book of Acts because they were written by both per, the same person. We're both treatises, former treatise, current treatise, if you will. So, but the point is that he's making a systematic exposition of the principles of the Christian faith. This is very important. This is actually one of the reasons why I went into the subject. And I say, this man says he's, he's writing, uh, he's, a, he's making a systematic exposition of the principles of the Christian faith. <clears throat> then everyone who professes 
the faith, especially those who are called to leadership in the faith, ought to pay attention to it. So it's one of the things that have actually motivated our going into the studies, and we have seen quite a lot so far. So beyond the historical facts of the recorded events, so in, first and foremost, the fact that these things were documented for us are proof positive that they, do, they did happen. You know, before people come up with all kinds of stories, oh, Jesus is a fictitious character, and, you know, and so on and so forth. Well, we have documented proof. So we know these are historical facts. But for the believer, for the minister of God, for the Bible student, beyond just knowing that these are historical facts, we should begin to look out for principles of the faith, principles of the Christian faith that we stand for. Because if we're called to be defenders of the faith, we must be able to defend it perfectly, accurately, more so according to you know, the dictates or the principles that have been uh, expressed for us in the book, in the book of Acts particularly. So the writer also clearly stated that this treatise was about all that Jesus began both to do and teach, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. This book, this treatise, so it's an exposition of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. <clears throat> what that means to us then is that the Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, don't forget if we go back to the words of Jesus concerning the Holy Spirit all the way back to the book of John especially, you see Jesus kept saying the Holy Spirit was going to take on from where he's living, or where he was, was going to leave off at. The Holy Spirit would do this, the Holy Spirit would do that, the Holy Spirit would take from him, the Lord Jesus, and would reveal to, 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 to his disciples, which by extension is us. So it means then that the Holy Spirit was standing in for Christ, was, he was in the place. When Jesus said, he will, he, whom the Father will send in my name, that means in my stead, in my place, my representative. So everything the Holy Spirit was doing that we find in the book of Acts was actually the Lord Jesus, you know, doing all of that, which aligns with the words of the writer, all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So it means then that it was the Holy Spirit carrying out all that Jesus would want to do and teach, even in the book of Acts. Now, what does that say to us then as ministers and as Bible students and those who have, you know, come to the, to the faith, disciples of Jesus. So the principles that this man is exposing in the book of Acts are actually coming from the Lord Jesus. So what we see revealed in the book of Acts is saying to us, this is what Jesus would do. This is how Jesus would do it. This is what Jesus would say. That's very important. It's about what Jesus began both to do and teach, and the Holy Spirit is the one carrying it out in the book of Acts. So the Holy Spirit was taken from Jesus and revealing to the church. The Holy Spirit was taken from Jesus and revealing to God's people. So we on the receiving end must receive these principles as what Jesus would want us to know or what he would want us to hear. So again, followers of Christ should pay close attention because Christ is being revealed in the principles shown from each event in the book of Acts. Everything we see revealed there. Principles, I mean, was Christ communicating those principles. Don't forget, he's the one who told us, actually, I'm there already. We also remember the Lord Jesus said that in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Actually, he said, on this rock. So when he says on this rock, it then means that he, he's talking about the revelation of himself, that which he has revealed or that which he was going to reveal through the Holy Spirit. On this rock, I will build my church. And actually, when you go to verse 19 of that same Matthew 16, he said, I will give you keys of the kingdom. That's a promise. I will. I will give you. Question then is, when did he give those keys? He gave those keys through the Holy Spirit. He gave those keys, as we see documented in the book of Acts. There's no way he could have said, I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then it never happened. And all, then the apostles and his disciples all died. No, at some point he did give those keys. Question is, when did he give those keys? So we see those documented in the book of Acts through the Holy Spirit. Now, question is, if the Lord Jesus gave the disciples and the apostles keys of the kingdom of God, what should we do about that? It, it means that we must dig deep to find out those keys, which are now what I call principles, of the faith embedded in the very stories we'll find in the book of Acts. 
Now, also observe based on Matthew 16, 18, it is only when this church is built upon that rock, which are the principles, which are the keys he's talking about, or the revelation of Christ, or the revealing of Christ, it is only then that the church cannot be defeated by the enemies of God. So, uh, you know, on the contrary, if we do anything other than that, then there is no guarantee that we might not be defeated by the enemies of God. Now, of course, understand the defeating of the enemy uh, by the enemies of God doesn't mean you're taken away from God's presence, or doesn't mean you've lost out of you know God's plan altogether. It just means you didn't you didn't win this battle, you know. But you won the battle of salvation at least. All right, let's proceed. So the book of Acts is a documentation of the fulfillment of these promises. And I have taken time to actually call them prophecies. They were not just promises, they were prophecies. See, a promise is just saying, I will do, I will do, or God will do. But when you're talking about prophecies, it's a little bit of, it's elevated. It, it, it takes on an elevated status. It is Christ declaring what has been predetermined by heaven's council. It is Christ declaring what the eternal had already predetermined was going to happen. So in other words, you couldn't go around it. You know, it promises, I mean, I will do it. And of course, being God, he will, he will keep his promises. But the prophetic declaration is declaring what heaven has pronounced, what heaven has ordained, what heaven has, you know, uh, ascertained. Remember in Acts chapter 1 verse 7, they came to him, will you at this time, you know, uh, 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 establish the kingdom? Of course, they, they were thinking of ejecting the Roman Empire and then establishing the kingdom of Israel. And here's what Jesus said. He said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons that God has ordained by his own power. By, by, by that, by inference, we know that there are times and seasons that God has ordained by his own power. So sometimes when Jesus spoke words, prophetic declarations, he was giving us a, a, a view you know, uh, uh, it was getting us into a realm to see what heaven had ordained or what God has set or ordained by his own power. For instance, you shall, look at that, you shall receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's no going back about it. It's going to happen because it's been ordained by heaven and you will be my witnesses. So it's, it's already ordained. So the church of Jesus Christ should aim to mirror what we see revealed in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is our prototype. The book of Acts is our template. The book of Acts is the fulfilling of the promise of Jesus when he said, I will build my church. Did he build that church? Yes, he did. How do we know and where can we find it? The book of Acts. The book of Acts. So when we look at the book of Acts, of course, it's, it's a mixture of things going on, human elements, you know, demonic elements, societal elements, but then with, with a little bit of discernment, we're able to see the operation of the Holy Spirit in all of that. Now, those we're supposed to hold on to because those are principles of the faith to which we've been called. So the Church of Jesus Christ, by extension, us ought to pay close attention to this and aim to mirror. That should be our pattern. That should be our template. What we find here should be what we follow. It should be what we establish. It should be what we defend. It should be what we establish and actually, you know, uh, uh, multiply, if you will. It, we don't just bring our own ideas or, or uh, adopt or import from here and there. No, we want to follow what Christ endorsed. We want to follow what the Holy Spirit endorsed. That is how we become the true church of Jesus Christ. To do contrary, actually, is to make ourselves a prey for the enemy. Because again, Matthew 16, 18, it is only when the church is founded upon the rock, which is the revealing of Christ or that which Christ reveals, that is the only time the gates of Hades, uh, you know, will not be able to prevail against it. We will not be able to be defeated by the enemies of God. But to do otherwise is to open doors for the enemy to take advantage. So let's talk about administration in the church. Because the number of things we reveal in the book of Acts, one of them is administration. So let's talk about administration in, the, in this early church. So one big challenge in the local churches today has to do with administration. Uh, a lot of people, you know, import administration from secular uh, processes. A lot of people import administration from different, you know, 
angle. Some just come up with their own ideas, whatever works for them. And I mean, to an extent that, that, that may make sense, but it is good to know what the Bible says. It is good to know what the early church, because the early church faced the same problem. It was also a problem with the early church, but then they did something about it. So we want to know what they did about it with hopes that we can also begin to establish the same, assuming we're not. And if we are already, then reinforce that because that is the way to go. So was the problem addressed? How was it addressed? Can we learn principles regarding church administration from the book of Acts? The answer is yes, but let's proceed. So let's start off with looking at, you know, dictionary to see what administration means. What is administration? Uh, from the Merriam-Webster.com, as the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online, uh, it has a number of entries. The first entry there says that administration is performance of executive duties as in management. The performance of executive duty, the performance of duties that have to do with execution, performance of duties related to executing what needs to be executed, to carry out what needs to be carried out. Now, when you go to dictionary.com, again, the first entry, it says it's the management of any office or business or organization, as in to give it direction. So the management of any office, the management of a business, the management of an organization, so as to give it direction. And I actually prefer that, I like that. So in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, we see that, as a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 6, we found that a problem arose that, that, that you know, drew the attention of the leadership of the church in Jerusalem and forced them into setting up some administration. But as we read in that Acts chapter 6, when we get to verse 3 especially, in verse 3, we see that uh, um, a choice of word was used that is quite interesting. Uh, give me one minute, let me see. So we see that, we see that in, in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, the, a choice of word was used that is very significant. Um, when you go to different versions of the Bible, that the word there is business. Some say business, or some say business, some say task, some say duty, some say assignment. King James actually called it problem. All right, so, so they acknowledge that it was a significant subject that should be handled. I mean, it's fair to say that, you know, uh, in fact, some considered it to be a problem, a problem that needed to be handled. But looking at the word, this word choice, especially the word business from Strong's Concordance, uh, that will take us to Strong, uh, the number is G5532. The Greek word is kria and it's pronounced kria. It says it's employment. And also by implication, it says something that is occasion, that something that is, you know, called for, or something that, that is, you know, demanded. There is a demand for it. Um, so, so give me one minute, just hold on. All right. So it says employment employment and is occasion because there's a demand for it and look at the word it says there's a requirement or destitution and now what do you mean by destitution it means something that is lacking something that is needed something without which you know business may not go well or things may not happen well now all of this is showing us how the apostles or the leaders of the early church considered this matter of course, you know the stories, the matter of the Hellenists, you know, complaining about their uh, daily portion of food, you know, not, not happening the way it should. Uh, it's very easy to brush that to the side, but the apostles considered it a major issue, a major problem, that if we don't handle this, it will handicap business, it will handicap the entire uh, project. So they, they saw it as something necessary, something needful, and something that was to be taken care of. Now, again, the Strong's, uh, uh, the, the earlier Strong we just saw made a reference to the Hebrew uh, aspect of it. That is H2818. And the word there is G-I-G -G from an Aramaic origin, but it's pronounced Kashak. 
It's pronounced kashak. And it says it's a necessity. It's a need. It's a duty. It's a business. So whether you're looking at Greek or you're looking at Aramaic Hebrew, same thing. It is, it is, it is a need. It's something that has to be attended to. But the, the Hebrew aspect actually puts a twist to it. It says there has to be the sense of readiness. So in other words, don't just see it as a problem, but see, be ready to, to, to encounter. In other words, expect it to happen. Uh, but also be careful how you handle it. So it's something to be handled with care and something that, you know, that needs to be handled with care. All right. So from, from all of that, we can now see why uh, the apostles said in, in Acts chapter 6, and I'm going to come more to that, that we cannot afford to abandon what we're doing to do this. Why? Because they saw that it was a full-time employment. They saw it as a business or th this business was supposed to be a full-time engagement, a full-time employment. They considered it that. They considered it a need, a demand, something lacking that is needful, the absence of which you know, could handicap the movement, something to be ready for. So that's why their response came the way it came. It now makes perfect sense. You know, they said, we cannot, you know, ignore or neglect. As a matter of fact, I went through a number of versions to look at that word, what they said there. King James says, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It's not reason. It doesn't make sense to do that. This is administration. New King James says, it is not desirable. So in other words, they don't even desire to do that. Amplify said it is not appropriate. It's not appropriate to abandon or neglect the work of God or the preaching of the word and prayer to serve these tables or to manage this affair. Amplified Classic says it is not seemly or desirable or right that we should have to give up or neglect. So it, it, it became a conflict of interest. So, you know, Whereas before now, when we read this, we thought it was just a matter of do it and come back. No, they saw it as a full-time engagement. So in other words, guys, if we focus on this, it's going to draw us away from the ministry of the word and prayer and saints of God and ministers of God and leaders especially. We've got to see it from that perspective. It is that demanding. It is that demanding. And we're talking about administration, but it can be that demanding that it pulls us away from the spiritual administration. Now, if you proceed uh, uh, in the Message Bible, it says it wouldn't be right for us to abandon our responsibilities for preaching and teaching the word of God. So in other words, taking this on is going to result in abandoning the ministry of the word and prayer. Names of God version says it is not right for us to give up God's word. So to, to entangle or get ourselves involved with that, it's going to bring us to a place where we give up the word of God, give up the ministry of prayer. The Passion Translation says it is not advantageous for us to be pulled away from the word of God to wait on tables. So that's a huge lesson to learn there, that administration, the, administ the, admi the, 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 the you know, administrating of the ministry and of the church can actually be so consuming that it pulls us away or lead us away, especially those with an apostolic call from the ministry of the word and prayer. And so what was the solution? What did they do? They came up with a solution and we find that in Acts chapter six and verse three. And I wanna read that from uh, the, the Passion Translation. It says, we want you to carefully select from among yourselves seven godly men Make sure they are honorable, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will give them the responsibility of this crucial ministry of serving. So it, it was a crucial thing. And it says they should take responsibility. So it's something that they had to manage. And listen, something is important there. So it means it's, it's up to you. Let's proceed. I think I, I, I touched it. So what was the solution? Carefully search from within the house. Carefully search from within the church. Carefully search from within the congregation. Carefully search from within, you know, the sphere of operation. Not from outside. Not from outside, but from within. 
this was the part of the solution. Find from within, look for, from within. So apparently it was not obvious. So it said, that's why the search was, was given. That's the, 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 the instruction to search for was given. I assume it would have taken some time to even accomplish that. But the point here is that they stuck to this principle. We're not taking from outside. It has to be come from, uh, from within. But then they give a criteria. They say ensure that the people you so, so the search criteria here is faithful, full of the spirit and wise. Faithful, full of the spirit and wise. And that is so important. Today we, we do it differently, but we see what they gave us the solution here. First and foremost, search from within, but here is the search criteria, faithful, full of the spirit and wise. What does that mean in our modern uh, parlance, in our modern way of talking? Proven experts on the job who have demonstratively embraced the mission and can take full responsibility of it. That's what they're talking about. Now, when I say experts, I don't mean you, you have to be the best of the best. It just means you're trained. It just means you know what you're doing. You're not a novice in the area. I mean, just like you cannot uh, 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 you know, fill your worship team with novices who don't know what music is about. So in the same way, every other administration ought to be people who have been trained to a certain degree, who at least know the job. But observe, they, they have demonstratively shown or they have proven in the past that they are, they are responsible, that they can be trusted, they are honorable, right? But also filled with the spirit. And that, that is a critical one. A lot of things we do in modern church today, we kind of put the Holy Spirit to the backside. But I've said again and again and again, the Holy Spirit was at the forefront in the early church. The Holy Spirit was the engine. The Holy Spirit was the, you know, the administrator. He was involved in everything. To take the Holy Spirit away is actually to mess things up. So you can see, even as little as the, this particular assignment was just to serve meals. But I assume it's beyond just serving meals. It was about getting resources to get the food, the cooking of the food, the distribution of the food. I imagine it would get to storage of the food and all of that stuff. So you can see why it's a full day's job, it means a full time job. So getting the resources, probably raising the money for it, getting the food, however the food came, storing it, you know, distributing it appropriately, cooking. You have to have to look at who is cooking to make sure the food is good and so on and so forth. So, so it's a full employment. And, and so whoever was going to take it had to be a, some, to some degree an expert in it, but also filled with a spirit. As simple as you might think that uh, function uh, was, they require that the Holy Spirit be a criteria. And that is something we must also take into consideration today. Now, so we see the delineation between the apostolic mandate and the responsibility to the word and prayer versus which we may call the administration of the spirit versus the administration of resources and attendant needs. What are attendant needs? Needs that arise as a function of ministry. You never know where it's going to come from. You never know what's going to happen. But the, the, the point here is that the, 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 these, these leaders were able to delineate the, the apostolic call, the apostolic responsibility from the serving of tables. So they didn't mix it up. And so in our time, we must make sure it's not mixed up. And we've had too many stories about, you know, leaders getting involved in things and, and things go all right, especially when we're not experts in those areas. So they were given to people who could take full responsibility of it while they devoted their time to the administration of the spirit and the word. Critical thing. And when we look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus, the exact same thing happened. Matthew 15, 32, you know, Jesus by now had been ministering for three days and the people were just following him. They didn't want to stop. So on the third day, he himself began to say, guys, you know, we can't send these people back you know, hungry, they're going to faint on the way. So let's give them something to eat. I need you to see the mind of Jesus in that story. You know, see the mentality of Christ. See, see his, his attitude to the people. See his thought process, you know, administration. And when you go back and read the full story, even the administration was so, was so great, made the people sit down on the grass, you know, searched around to find who had food. And then we found a, a young man who, I don't know how he did it for three days, he still had the food. Maybe he had more than that before then. 
And Jesus, okay, that would do, but also brought the spiritual dimension into it. So for those who may separate, you know, human, you know, the issues with human resources and the administration of what you may call mundane things, please let's not do that because the Holy Spirit is interested in attending to these things, which is why I went into all of those studies, because it's needful. It's a demand. It's, 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 a, it's a handicap if we don't handle it. It can actually impede on the advancement of the kingdom. So God would want us to do that. Jesus would want us to do that. So you see again, Jesus ministering through the Holy Spirit and through these disciples and apostles here, what he would have done. So take care of the Hellenists, take care of the people. And it doesn't have to be Hellenists in our time, nor does it have to be food at all, but God cares for people and administration within the church ought to be concerned about that. But not to infringe on the spiritual administration or the ministry of the word and prayer, rather to look for experts who are dedicated, who are, you know, embrace the mission, filled with the spirit and approved by the people, honorable before the people to take responsibility of administrations, while those who are the called into the work of the ministry focus on the word and prayer. All right, so let's proceed. <clears throat> So when we look at John chapter 12, okay, um, I'm not going to go through this, but this is also the Lord Jesus Christ having administration um, in terms of a treasurer by the name of Judas. Something I actually found that, you know, from Judas's name, I didn't see that before now. His name is Cariot. His Cariot actually talks about a locksmith. So he probably was given that name because either he was a locksmith or because he was the one who was over the lock box, <laughs> over the lock box, the treasure box. So in a way, Iscariot might actually mean Judas the treasurer, Judas the keeper of the box, Judas the keeper of the, of the purse, Judas, you know, the, the accountant, <laughs> if you will. So Jesus had one, even though we're told here that, you know, the man didn't care about the purse. So you can see what I'm trying to draw out from here is Judas didn't have the heart of Christ. So he was not one who had embraced the mission. He probably was an expert on the job. I mean, he was an accountant, which probably was why it was given to him to start with. But Judas had not embraced the mind of Christ, had not embraced the heart of Christ, had, had not embraced the vision or the mission. The Bible said here that he, when he was saying about, oh, the, the alabaster oil could have been sold, the perfume could have been sold, and the money given to the poor, that he really didn't care about the poor. <laughs> he really didn't care about the people. He was really saying that so as, you know, so that there will be money in the poor, so when he wants to take some, he can take it. But I also saying that, you know, bringing this out for, to warn that those who are given such privilege to serve in the kingdom of God now, uh, again, is a full employment. I know some people uh, may not, wants the pay because you probably have a job going on and you just want to lend your expertise to the work of the ministry that's great but ministers also consider for those who may not be who may not be able to take care of themselves financially you know to be able to because again understand is a full-time employment is a full-time employment so that is something to actually look into uh i mean for young churches you may not have the money to do that right now but begin to think about it but, but I want us to start with, first and foremost, from within, don't forget that, somebody from within, somebody who has been trained for that particular area. For instance, if it's accounting, somebody who has been trained as an accountant and understands the process of accounting, somebody who has been trained as, you know, uh, one who keeps money, either in the bank or whatever. If you have such people in your church, those are the people you want to use for that. And if they have a job, many of them are very happy to serve and not even demand for any salary or any pay. But if we have to pay, then so be it, because this should not intertwine with the ministry of, especially as the ministry begins to grow to a portion where, you know, it becomes much like a, a must to do that. All right. But everything we've just said right now is local administration in the local church. It was all happening in the church in Jerusalem. So let's now talk about global administration, because the church we know eventually grew beyond the boundaries of Jerusalem. So as the church grew beyond the boundaries of Jerusalem and Judea, the need arose for a shift in administrative paradigm and scope. Uh, the move of the Holy Spirit had broken previous conceptions. We talked about this the other time. 
don't forget, these guys went into ministry with a perception, Jews only. But then the Holy Spirit broke that perception. I mean, here the Holy Spirit was just moving around and filling everybody, filling up Gentiles and leaving the apostles to handle the fallout. You know, it was almost like, okay, guys, we, did, we weren't ready for this. We thought it was just going to be us, you know, just brethren, just Jews. Now you're all over the place baptizing everybody. How are we going to handle this? So literally, they were forced to transform their administration. It was that the Holy Spirit was like, catch up, guys. I'm going, make sure you catch up. But they had already established administration was something that had to be done. Because think about it. If they didn't see it from that perspective, they could have just dropped the ball. They could have just said, you know, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, find some way to handle this. But they came to understand this administration ought to be done. It has to be done. It needs to be done. So even though the ministry grew so rapidly and so, you know, uh, widespread, they did whatever they could to, to, you know, put administration in place. All right, so that brings us to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is a very powerful uh, chapter of the Bible. Um, a lot of Bibles will call it the Jerusalem Council. And actually, Kingdom Ministers United, you know, our, 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 our process, leadership process and all of that is founded on Acts 15. It's part of our document we, we talked about. But let's, let's look at it. So I'm not going to read the whole thing for time's sake, but in verse one, we see that it, what started up this issue was a do doctrinal conflict. Uh, certain Jews came from Jerusalem and from Judea and, I'm sorry, the Jerusalem Council? The Jerusalem Council, yes. The Jerusalem Council. So, so a doctrinal issue came up. Certain Jews, certain, you know, teachers came from Jerusalem and from Judea and, uh, you know, traveled outside of those places and began to preach to a Gentile. Of course, don't forget, we already know by now the Holy Spirit had made it clear it's okay to preach to Gentiles. So, and Paul by now was already in ministry. But these guys came and was preaching to some of the uh, Gentiles they found, imposing Judaism. And remember, we talked about that on Sunday, uh, the conflict of covenants, the, you know, the, <clears throat> the two covenants in conflict. So these guys were imposing Judaism on, on the, the, the new converts who were not Jews. So they were telling them they had to follow the laws of Moses, particularly circumcision. So that, we may not deal with that today, but it's just a doctrinal issue. And today we have too many doctrinal issues. We have too many doctrinal issues, doctrinal conflicts. One believes this way, the other believes the other way. Well, so we have an example here. The apostles and the early church faced the same situation. How did they deal with it? Well, so Paul and Barnabas, you know, had a heated argument with this brethren who came from Jerusalem, telling them, no, it, it's not so, and we're not going to accept that. It became a conflict. It became some, I mean, a sharp one. So the brethren now said, okay, let's send Paul and Barnabas back to Jerusalem to go meet the elders, the apostles, and the elders. And that is powerful. Do we have that today? Do we have things in place today to, so that uh, uh, conflict resolution can happen? You know, so that there's an el el you know, a board of elders, a council of elders, or, you know, some people say presbyteros, a presbytery of elders. But, but here's what I'm getting at. Uh, there are a lot of ministry networks today that, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody down, please, but what we're trying to do here is to follow scriptures. The Bible said in verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together, not just the apostles. Today, we try to make it all about apostles, apostles, no, apostles and the elders. So again, something else that is a very subtle, um, subtle information there, not everybody was an apostle. <clears throat> elders were also recognized in leadership, even though they were not apostles. That's one. Another subtle information, apostolic ministry is relevant for the church. It is a ministry of Christ. Let's stop arguing with it. It's a part of the ministry. Christ ordained it for a specific purpose. But you're going to find out uh, the, as you moved away from Jerusalem and began to go into the churches of uh, the, the Gentiles, particularly the Ephesian church, you're going to find out that the apostolic council, now it's called an apostolic council, but it doesn't mean everybody there is an apostle. It's an apostolic council because it is, it is representative of the, the, the mandate of Christ. So it's called an apostolic council. But you should have 
those who are called into the apostolic ministry. So in other words, apostles, you should also have prophets there. And then you should have elders coming from the other uh, uh, ministry graces. So where you have a council and it's only apostles, it's not complete. When you have a council and it's only prophets, it's not complete. When you have a council, and I've seen some people say the, the council of apostles and prophets. Okay, that's fine, but it's still not complete. Elders were given, you know, uh, uh, their due honor, due respect. And of course, the word elder talks both in terms of uh, maturity in spiritual understanding, and I would think maturity in age as well. So those who are mature in the things of God, mature in spiritual matter, mature in the mission, mature in the overall agenda of God, should be included in the apostolic council. These are administrative prototypes that we see in the book of Acts that we don't follow. These things ought not to be so. Today, what we have is a pyramid structure. And you know, the, the, the system of God is never a pyramid. What is a pyramid structure? A pyramid structure is where at the base, it is broad, everybody comes in, but at the top, the higher you go, it ends up in one person. One man becomes the overall Lord. One man becomes the overall captain, the overall chief, chief apostle or whatever ecclesiastical title he or she goes by. That is not of Christ. The Christ pattern is a, a, a council, uh, a company, you know, a company of leaders, an apostolic council. That is what it should be. Even when God has raised you up as a minister of God to become such a great servant of the Lord, minister of God, you should bring others in so as not to be all by yourself. When you're the one who hires and fires, when you're the one, you know, the final word, you know, everything is about you, you, then you're not following the pattern of Christ. The pattern of Christ, again, don't forget, that's why I had to build the foundation from the start. It was all about Jesus, what Jesus began to do and teach. And the Holy Spirit was taken from Jesus and revealing to the church. So whatever principles we see laid out here is telling us this is what Christ would have us do. So it's not about Apostle General, the chief apostle, you know, the, the supreme leader and all of that. No, it was a a council, the apostles and the elders came together. There's got to be that coming together. And then as, as they proceed, you take your time and read Acts 15, but as they got to verse 7, Simon now stood up because even when they got there, the debate continued. They got into a heated argument while the meeting was going on. So Simon stood up, and I, I need you to pay attention to this. So beautiful. Simon stood up and observed Simon did not start with biblical text. Sometimes that's where we are because we quickly defer to a, a biblical text, a knowledge base that we've, we had before the time. And sometimes that knowledge base is coming from a denominational perspective. Oh, this is how we do it in the, the Presbyterian church. This is how we do it in the Catholic church. This is how it's done in Lutheran and so on and so forth. So when you come from the Bibl from textual perspective, you know, from a contextual perspective, you may have problems because your understanding of the biblical text must be different from the understanding of somebody else. Where did Simon start from? Who? Simon started from the operation of the spirit. And don't forget, I said this on Sunday when Jesus Christ said, those who will worship him will worship him first in spirit and then truth, not the word first, the spirit first. And I know that will mess up some people's theology because in our mentality, it is the word for us before the spirit. No, but the scripture shows us it is spirit for us, then the word. And by the way, if the spirit does not breathe upon the word, what understanding are you getting, by the way? If the spirit is not there to breathe upon what you call the word, what you call an insight, a revelation of the word, whose revelation is that if it is not the spirit breathing upon it? So it has to be the spirit for us, then the word. And by the way, the spirit is called the spirit of truth. So being the spirit of truth, he's the one who conveys truth. So I say to you, man of God, woman of God, minister of God, church leader, let the spirit guide, let the spirit lead. Now, when you see the direction of the spirit, then begin to look for words or scriptures to explain that or to found it or to ground it. Don't start with the word and then expect the spirit to confirm what you believe is the word. Very critical. Simon did not start with biblical text. He started with the operation of the spirit. And don't forget, if you go back to his experience, Acts 11, he had thought in a certain way and he had scriptures for that. Because when you go back to the days of Moses, the word said, don't have anything to do with Gentiles. 
Don't marry them. If you touch them, you're defiled. So, so if you look at it from that perspective, Simon had scriptural text to back his perception. But when the spirit moved, he had to change his, what he would call his perception based on scripture. So it is the spirit, not just the word. Simon starts with that. He points to the work of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit mesmerizes theological understanding, his theological background. This is what I thought was true, but the Spirit of God broke that. He baptized Cornelius. And by the way, he's been doing that all the while. Samaria, all the place, people are being baptized who are Gentiles. So the question then is, if the Spirit is giving them the baptism of the Spirit, uh, what does that say to us? It says to us, they're accepted by God. And so if they're accepted by, by God, why do we want to put a stumbling block on their way? Powerful. And then he also highlighted the work of grace. And grace has to be highlighted in our work today. Because a lot of times we go into legalism and legalism causes a lot of problem. We must begin to highlight the grace of God. Everything we do, everything we are in the kingdom is by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without his grace, we are nothing, absolutely nothing. Whatever we try to accomplish in our own ability is not even accepted in the sight of God. It is his grace. Simon also highlighted that in verse 11. And then in verse 12, he now brings Simon, uh, not Simon, Paul and Barnabas to give a testimony of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the Gentile nations. And so audience was given to them. And so Barnabas and Paul began to give testimony. This is what God is doing in the lands. This is what he's doing in the nations. This is what, I'm, and we're going to come to that. Missions was a critical aspect of, you know, the early church. And we also must make missions a critical aspect of our ministries today. They began to give testimonies of what God was doing in the Gentile nations. And then James now stood up. It was James who now brought prophetic text. It was James who now took it back to scriptures, okay? Everything Simon says is true. And I actually have scriptures to prove them because the prophets said the same thing. And so James quoted the prophetic utterances of prophets of old, which lines up with the spiritual move, the move of the spirit that Simon had talked about. This is a template for us. But then when they got to verse 20, they, 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 they first agreed. They said, okay, uh, okay, we're not going to put any stumbling block on these people's way, but we must draw the line. Here's where the line has to be drawn. No sexual immorality, no eating of strangled things or things sacrificed to idols, and, and so on and so forth. And if you do that, you're fine. So a line was drawn. And this is coming not from an individual, but from an apostolic council. They agreed. They unified. They heard each other. They remembered the words of Jesus Christ. They remembered prophetic utterances. They considered the move of the spirit. They heard testimonies of what God was doing. They put all of that together with their own maturity of the spirit. And then they reached a conclusion, reached an agreement. That is powerful. That is powerful. And so the apostolic council endorsed both Paul and Barnabas and what they had agreed upon. This is where written for example, sense of God. Today we have a manner of conflict going on. And sometimes it looks like we, we don't know what we're doing. We can't handle things, but we have it here. Uh, you know, when was the last time a local church had issues and then sought to, 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 to elders, count, uh, you know, for, an, for a council of elders made up of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and people who were sound in the word of God to resolve issues. We don't. And when we don't do that, the enemy beats us blue-black because we're not following the pattern. Now, in continuing now, Paul, of course, you know, carried it further to the ends of the earth. So he had to also establish administration in the churches of the Gentiles. For instance, when he got to Acts 20, uh, this was getting towards the end of his ministry, verse 17 to 36. The Bible says in verse 17 that he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when he admonished them and spoke to them and all of that, in verse 36, the Bible said, he knelt down and prayed with them all. What do we see there? We see that Paul had apostolic oversight for the church at Ephesus. Imagine that. He's sending for the elders to come to meet him in Miletus, and they will travel. That's almost like a, an apostolic conference, like a conference being held and leaders coming from all over the place to be a part of that. But we must also say it's not just anybody who calls himself father, covering, whatever. Paul labored in the church of, of, of Ephesus. We see that Paul, Paul's work 
most of his work, most of his labor was done at the church at Ephesus. You're not going to see this happen, for instance, to the church in Asia and to some other churches. This was particularly to the church at Ephesus. So Paul had demonstrated that he was truly an apostle sent to these people. They had embraced him. Many of them had become, you know, uh, his protege, he had ministered the word, raised them in the faith, stayed with them for upwards of up to three years, as a matter of fact. So, so he qualified to be an apostolic father, an apostolic leader, one who had an apostolic oversight over these ones. And when he sent for them, there was no delay. They all came. He blessed them and prayed over them because he, he knew that he had an apostolic uh, oversight over them. But when you look at Acts 14 and verse 23, he and Barnabas, and this, I believe, was the second missionary journey, you know, traveling, going back to inspect the churches. The first time they went was just to preach the word. But at the second time they went, they now they began to appoint elders in the churches. Of course, these churches were just growing. They were, some of them, infant churches. So, but, but yet they saw the need to establish leadership, to establish administration. They were not just left to their own devices, you know, uh, but rather the Bible said that he and Barnabas, verse 23, so when they had appointed elders, and look at that, in every church, so no church was left out. They appointed elders, elders. And, and this is important also, uh, you can see the stages of development. So they didn't just quickly make people apostles. As a matter of fact, when you read, <laughs> we don't have all the time for all of this, but when you read through the book and through the ministry of Christ and all of that, you're gonna see that you know, the apostolic ministry is one that is endorsed by Christ, is one that is endorsed by the Holy Spirit. It's not just something people take up on their own, just take up for themselves. There is a demonstrative proof that one has been called into that. But eldership, absolutely. Eldership was given to, again, one who had longevity in the things of God, maturity in the things of God, and I would assume also uh, natural age. So they appointed elders in every church for two reasons. Again, like I said, one, the fact that these churches were just growing. So you probably didn't have established offices as in apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers, but you had mature believers. So they were appointed to become elders over the churches. So, of course, the, the idea you're going to see later on, Paul said, those who have, you know, used the, their leadership role well could be counted for double honor. So, again, service determined promotion. Faithful service determined promotion. And, and so I'm going to leave that at that, but let's just move on. Now, when you get to Acts 19 and verse 22, we find that Paul had raised up a few people like Timothy. Timothy had been raised up you know, by Paul to be a protege in the ministry. Uh, we're told in Acts 19.22 that he sent into Macedonia two of those who had ministered to him. One of them is Timothy, the other is Erastus. Both of them were sent to Macedonia to carry, so he could trust them. He knew he had raised them up, he had trained them. They knew the mission, they knew the agenda, they knew the focus, they knew how he would preach. So Paul had no issue sending them, said, go and minister in Macedonia while I you know, take care of Asia for a while. And so we see Timothy is one rising up to become a leader, an apostolic leader, as a matter of fact, in the, in the time of Paul. And later on, not in the book of Acts, but later on in the writings of Paul, we see the likes of Titus and Philemon. Titus and Philemon came on board because we know he wrote personally to these three. Those were the three individuals he wrote to. The others were to churches primarily. So these three were dear to his heart, definitely. These three were close to him. Uh, Titus, I mean, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. These were protégés, these were ministers he had raised up to be co-laborers with him. Then we see in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he instructed Titus to appoint elders in regions he had not been opportune to go or to do so. So Titus had been raised to a point where uh, the Paul could entrust him with the, with, the, with the role of appointing elders in churches. So he was much like a senior leader himself. So look at the Titus verse one, chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. So he could trust Titus to be able to set things in order because Titus had been with him for a while, understood how the churches of God need to operate, understood the mission of God, understood the apostolic mandate, and so he could be sent for to do that. And he said, appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So at this time, 
I think their missionary effort was from city to city. So they wanted to have at least one church in a city, one church in a city, one church in a city. So appoint elders in every city that they had planted a church, as I commanded you. A similar instruction was also given to Timothy for bishops, overseers, and deacons. Now, it's important to also say here, and this is not, not to demean or bring anybody down or anything. I want us to see here that how these terms were used in the days of Paul. Now, Timothy, I mean, we're not told uh, whatever title he was given or was carrying, but we can tell he was an apostle. We can tell he was apostolic. We could tell that he had been with uh, uh, Paul and understood the mission of Paul and could actually deputize for Paul. But look at him now. Paul is saying that he should be the one to instruct even bishops, overseers, and deacons in local churches. So today, the, you know, we're title crazy, bishop, archbishop, all of that stuff. But there are things in the word of God that we can look at and know how these things ought to be. Uh, you know, it's all about understanding the agenda of God. It's all about being called by God. It's all about being ordained by God to do a certain work for him. It's not about the title craze. When you read 1 Timothy 3, you see the whole thing. But when it got to 1 Timothy 5, 17, it says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So we see there that one of the criteria for making elders was also their knowledge in scriptures knowledge in scripture. So it's not just about uh, maturity in age, but also maturity in the things of God, maturity in the word of God and in doctrine. So in other words, ability to teach, they were able to teach and not just having the ability to teach, but knowing what to teach. Not everything is being taught. There is a way because Paul later rebuked some people who were teaching a foreign doctrine. So these ones, you could say, knew Paul's style of teaching, knew the message that Paul was bringing forth. So elders were ordained based on that. So one thing we see as we begin to bring it to a close, one thing we see is that administration in the early church revolved around a number of things. Number one, approval of the Holy Spirit. You cannot take that out of the equation. We must all get back to the Holy Spirit. Every one of us must get back to the Holy Spirit. He is the administrator. He is in charge. The church is founded uh, of course, upon Christ, but the Holy Spirit is representative of Christ in the early church. So approval of the Spirit must be the first thing, not just gifts, not just talents, not just skills, not just education, not money, not family affiliation, not any of those things. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit should be the first thing we're looking for. And then, of course, knowledge and maturity in the work of the ministry, but also Listen to this. The administration you're putting in place should be for the work of the ministry, for the advancement of the work. So administration was crafted in such a way that it advanced the work. Or administration was put in such a place so that, you know, a hindrance was not put on the work of the ministry. So when we craft administration, it should be to advance the work. It should be to advance the ministry. It should be to advance the kingdom of God. It should be to to administrate the, the move of God, if you will. When we set administration and it comes, it, you know, runs a conflict course against the move of the spirit, that is not administration of God. When we set up organization or administration and it stifles the move of the spirit, that is not of God either. When we set up administration and it, 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 it you know, elevates flesh above spirit, that is not of God either. When we set up administration in such a way, it becomes a thing of lobbying. Everybody's lobbying. That is not of God either. Administration was crafted in the early church to actually aid the move of the spirit, to advance the work of the ministry. So administration should be crafted in, in that manner so that the work of the ministry is not hindered. The flow of the spirit is not hindered. But also the people who were you know, brought in into administration were faithful to the mission. Are we choosing people who understand the vision? understand the mission, understand the agenda, both the overall agenda of God and the agenda of the local church, of course, in alignment with the agenda of Christ. Then there is qualification. We don't just pick novices. 
Don't just pick somebody and put them in an office that you know they have no training for. I know a lot of churches do in-house training. That's wonderful. But it's, it's, it's a travesty to just pick somebody just because you like them or because they are family member or because they are donors to your, to your ministry and then put them in an office that they have no training or no knowledge about. It's just going to mess things up. Qualification was necessary. Paul, uh, Simon called it wisdom. Then maturity, of course. There's got to be maturity in, 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 in the whole thing. And then, of course, knowledge of scriptures and the overall plan of God. Because people who we bring into administration should not be totally removed from the ministry. They should be actually teachers. They should be deacons. They should be those who are able to teach the word. They should be those who understand the call of God, who understand the mission, the, the mission of God, the mission of Christ, who understand the apostolic mandate and are themselves a part of the work. So they're not removed. And I say that because a lot of times when, when certain decisions are, are to be made, there's a conflict of interest. You're going to see fleshly ideas coming up from people who are not spiritual. You're going to see deacons trying to run the ship aground. You're going to see, in fact, it's gotten to the point where some founding ministers have been dethroned and pushed out of their own church. How do you do that? Where does that come from? If you have the mind of Christ, you wouldn't do that. If you understand the call of God, you wouldn't do that. And because the Holy Spirit was not given the right of way, and not just right of way, but actually Lord over the, the work, then things go according to man's plan, go according to human wisdom, human reasoning, and so on and so forth. So we want to make sure people who we bring into administration are people who are truly, you know, uh, filled with the Spirit, you know, experienced or qualified for the, for the job, but are also people who have embraced the vision, embraced the call of God. And with that, we come to the end of today's session. I want to quickly again remind us tomorrow, <clears throat> we're having a service at 10 a.m., Thanksgiving, prophetic worship, prophetic prayers. It will not be posted uh, publicly on Facebook uh, or YouTube, but it will be on Zoom. So if you could join us at uh, 10 a.m. your central time, the information is right there. And if you, want, if you can get it, you can reach out to us and we can send it to you. And with that, let us pray. Father, we give you praise again. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for these things are embedded in your word. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for digging them out, bringing them out for us to see and revealing them to us. Again, we want to repent for doing things our own way. But Holy Spirit, as you take from the Lord Jesus and you reveal to us, you revealed it in the church then, and now you're revealing it to us, we receive it. We receive it with gratitude. We receive it with thanks. And now we ask for wisdom. We ask for understanding. We ask for grace. We ask, Lord, for favor. That, Lord, you begin to bring our way or bring us to places and to people who are able to fill in certain roles that are needed in the church so that, you know, that those who are called uh, 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 to the ministry of the spirit and to the word are not overwhelmed by, you know, the secular, the, 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 the needs, the attendant needs that come with ministry. But, Lord, that people will begin to rise up. And, and take their roles, take their places, especially areas of the ministry that they know they are trained for, that they qualify for, that they can truly handle. That begins to shove off responsibilities from some of your leaders who are double, you know, double shifting, doing a double shift here and there. Lord, help us. It has been your grace keeping so many. And for bigger churches out there, mega churches and, and, and cathedrals and stuff, Lord, we pray that this word would go forth so that those, of, those who have you know, take into a, a secular administration, a worldly administration, administration taken out from the wisdom of this world. The Bible said it is corrupt. The wisdom that we should go for is the wisdom that comes from above. The Bible says it's pure. It is peaceable. It is of God and it's the one that is approved of God. But sensual wisdom, the worldly wisdom, fleshly wisdom or demonic wisdom cannot be approved by God. So churches, Lord, that have taken administrative strategies and protocols and processes from, from the world that is ruled not by the Spirit of God, Lord, that will begin to make the migration, the transition, the transformation into that which is truly of that by God. Lord, cause your church to advance. Cause your people to advance. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, elders, deacons, church leaders, Lord, church ministers, everyone in every area, every joint supplying so that your church continues to advance on him that we thank you for it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you again so much for your time. Until we come your way again, stay elevated. We love you. God bless you.